Uh, no. Good evening and welcome to between Juneteenth and the 4th of July. Um, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Social Justice Ministry of the Church of God in Christ. First and foremost, I want to give honor and respect and deference to our leader, uh, the presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, the Bishop J. Drew Sheard, who saw um, it as necessary to elevate social justice ministry in the church of God in Christ and to elevate um, the voice of the church of God in Christ in the public sphere. Let me say uh, from the outset that we are grateful for every one of you that are here on this evening, both those that are in the webinar uh, and those that are uh, streaming this live. Before we begin anything, we want to have a word of prayer. Eternal and almighty God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness, for your love and kindness, and for your tender mercy. We pray that you would guide this discussion and that you would give us empowerment and inspiration to make the world a better place and to be the prophetic voice that you would have us to be during these difficult seasons. This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I want to welcome our panelists. I want to welcome all of our attendees. Um, by way of background, let's just say that we are now living in some very trying times. Um, racial polarization, political division, uh, gun violence and, and terrorism um, that is happening uh, all over the nation. And it's a time where the church must stand up and be the prophetic voice in the public sphere. It was the late Dr. James Cone that said, any authentic theology must affirm that God is on the side of the oppressed. There's another saying that says justice is not political, it's biblical. Uh, I often reference Micah 6 and 8. He has shown you, old man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And that is definitely uh, our calling uh, for this time and this space. I want to ask uh, if Brother Beal, who is uh, my co-host here, uh, could search in the attendees and perhaps uh, we may have some of our panelists that are on that side that need to be elevated. We're looking for the Bishop J. Lewis Felton. We're looking for Brother uh, Mike McBride as well. We just want to make sure um, that, that, they are, that they are not somewhere else. Uh, instead of being on this side of the aisle, uh, as they are uh, integral parts of today's conversation. Good evening, Bishop Swan. I see Bishop Felton. Thank God for you, my brother. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, those who co-labor with me in this ministry, uh, Brother Joseph Shannon, uh, who is the coordinator of Racial Justice and Restoration Advocacy. Um, Brother Ladarius, uh, Elder Ladarius uh, Beal, the coordinator of education reform advocacy and our secretary. Also, uh, uh, Elder Jamar Boyd, who is the coordinator of criminal justice reform advocacy uh, as well. Uh, this is a new ministry within the Church of God in Christ. And although the Church of God in Christ, as you're going to hear shortly uh, from Bishop Felton, has had a history of social justice advocacy. Um, this is the first time it has been elevated to um, the level of a standing ministry within the church. And so uh, we're asking any and everyone who is part of the Church of God in Christ, who is interested in becoming involved, please drop your name, your email, your telephone number, your contact information 
in the chat section. Our coordinators will pick that information up and we will definitely uh, connect with you. Um, so let me start um, with one of um, the great bishops of our church, um, a statesman, uh, a preacher par excellent, um, also a uh, social justice advocate in his own right, um, vice president of the NAACP in Philadelphia area, uh, among other things that he continues to do um, to push um, the issue of justice uh, in our community and in our nation. Bishop J. Lewis Felton, I've asked him to talk to us today about um, the church as an advocate for justice. And so at this time, I want you to receive uh, the Bishop J. Lewis Felton. Thank you so much, Bishop Swan. And certainly we are grateful for this opportunity uh, to share together in this much needed critical dialogue about the role of the church uh, in social justice. Perhaps it may be helpful for us to better understand our role in social justice when we realize that Jesus not only refers to us as the church, but he gives us the keys to the kingdom. We are God's kingdom. Jesus was a kingdom preacher. He uses the word kingdom over 105 times and only used the word church three times. So it is obvious that with a kingdom emphasis, the Lord Jesus Christ places a tremendous onus upon us to lead in areas of justice for all people. So then the church is God's kingdom agent for justice in the world. No one was a better advocate for justice than the Lord Jesus Christ as Jesus hung upon the cross to level the playing field for every human being, past, present, and future. In leveling the playing field, according to the prophecy of Isaiah uh, concerning the coming of Jesus Christ, every mountain and hill shall be made low. Every valley shall be exalted. The crooked shall be made straight, rough places made smooth, and ultimately this provides for the glory of the Lord being revealed. The church then must have a kingdom emphasis upon justice. This is to say that we must see the matter of justice more than as an organizational or denominational standpoint. The kingdom of God is much bigger than any organization or denomination. So when we look at the issue of justice from the context of Jesus' kingdom lens, we have an authority to engage in social justice. That authority is global. It is worldwide, which is to say that we have more authority in these matters than anyone else. The authority of the mayor ends at the city limits. The authority of the governor ends at the state border. The authority of the president ends at the international border. But the authority of God's kingdom ambassadors is worldwide. Jesus does not say, go into all your city and preach the gospel or into all your state or your country or your side of the tracks. He gives us global authority by commanding us to go into all the world. But that's only the beginning. Inasmuch as our authority is interplanetary as the kingdom, whatever I bind on earth, God binds in heaven. And what I loose on earth, God looses in heaven. Jesus 
institutes his authority in three worlds. Jesus is Lord in heaven, he's Lord in earth, he's Lord under the earth. Every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. So when you say the name Jesus, you have an obligation to provide leadership from a kingdom perspective in social justice. And as long as we consider ourselves as church preachers, we will handcuff ourselves on speaking out on these issues. But once you realize God has given you kingdom authority, you cannot be silent anymore. And that is why God has placed his hands upon the church of God in Christ as a kingdom agent. Remember, the church of God in Christ has taken positions on issues for more than a hundred years. And in so doing, we have had people to come on our turf, uh, such as Roy Wilkins, Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, Emmett Till, the lynching of this teenager is the spark that put the civil rights movement in action. The Church of God in Christ is no stranger to this activity. So then if you understand that Emmett Till, Medgar Evers are members of the Church of God in Christ, the funeral of Malcolm X was held at Child's Memorial, Church of God in Christ. Dr. King's climactic speech, I've been to the mountaintop, was made at Mason Temple, Church of God in Christ. We are God's ambassadors on these matters, and we must not allow that to be a generational divide. If God could use Emmett Till, Medgar Evers, if God could use us to embrace Malcolm X, when others shut their doors from having his funeral, if God could use us to bring Martin Luther King to the mountaintop to make his final speech, then let's recommit ourselves as God's kingdom agent to bringing about justice for all people and speaking out with confidence, courage, and conviction on these critical matters. Thank you, Bishop Swan. Thank you, Bishop Felton, um, for that succinct uh, synopsis of the church's um, involvement in justice issues. And, and we're going to circle back around because he's also going to um, give us some potential steps that the church can take in these times. Uh, I want to thank God for uh, Pastor Mike McBride, who um, is out there on the forefront of so many issues, the pastor of the Way Church. Um, out there in the Bay Area of California, a part of Live Free and so many other um, organizations that are doing kingdom work uh, in pushing the envelope towards justice. Pastor Mike, come and talk to us about some of the work uh, that you're doing, particularly uh, the challenges of gun violence, police brutality um, that is uh, sweeping our nation um, and the advocacy that you all are doing and how you all are being violence interrupters and how the church can become a part uh, of those particular efforts. Would you receive Pastor Michael McBride? Grace and peace to everyone. Uh, it is um, <clears throat> certainly my hope to communicate the, the depth and breadth of the reality that we continue to face as we struggle with the disproportionate loss, injury, and impact, trauma impact of gun violence in our communities, uh, the violence that is uh, both interpersonal in nature, uh, the violence that is a result of self-harm, and certainly the violence that is also perpetuated uh, at the hands of uh, the state, whether it is uh, the violence of law enforcement agencies, uh, whether it is the violence of the state through the death penalty, or whether it is the violence of uh, uh, white nationalist groups uh, operating uh, across our country uh, in many respects under the color of the law or certainly with a certain level of, of lack of accountability. 
uh, I would like to just ground or foreground my remarks uh, in uh, a little bit of data. What we do know is that uh, gun violence is the number one uh, cause of death for black men in this country between the ages of uh, 18 and uh, 45. Uh, black men make up 52% of all gun homicides in the United States, despite comprising less than 6% of the population. Uh, gun violence via intimate partner violence uh, is the number two cause of death for black women and girls in this country. Uh, we also uh, are, have found that uh, the majority of gun deaths in this country are suicides. 58% um, uh, of all of the deaths in this country are a result of a firearm uh, taking the life of the individual who has sought to end their life. And uh, all of these um, remaining numbers of gun deaths or at least injuries are a result of uh, accidental shootings. Uh, and so one of our hopes uh, in the conversation around gun violence for the past decade or so has been, can we shift our conversation uh, around gun violence to be inclusive or at least expanded around a public health issue, realizing that gun violence is often the result of anger, fear, and pain that has largely been unaddressed and unprocessed. It is a result of uh, mental health and uh, 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 trauma, unrelated, uh, I'm sorry, unaddressed trauma that often leads uh, individuals to uh, uh, issues or, or uh, uh, spaces of self-harm. And then obviously we have the, the overarching issue of sexism, of homophobia, transphobia, racism, all of the many ways in which uh, the othering and uh, the violence that is against and postured towards identity groups in this country uh, all combine to form and create an environment where disproportionate groups uh, are often uh, susceptible to gun-related uh, violence and homicides. Uh, we have been working for well over a decade in our Live Free Spaces, uh, a network that we've partnered with so many in the Church of God in Christ, as well as many other Black denominations, Black church denominations, as well as some uh, uh, evangelical, Catholic, et cetera, to create a, a national faith movement to address gun violence from a public health issue. Uh, in 2019, we were able, along with so many uh, partners across the country, to help co-author a bill that was called Break the Cycle of Violence Act. In this bill, we called for an investment of about a billion dollars over eight years to make sure that communities across the country that were dealing with violence also had a public health uh, a response that could indeed scale up uh, best practices related to uh, intra-communal gun violence in black and brown communities without growing the prison population. Uh, at the turn of the uh, administration's transition, we were also able to be in relationship and conversation with uh, the Biden administration and that $1 billion number grew to $5 billion and it was included in the, uh, the most recent uh, Build Back Better Act that did not uh, uh, fortunately get passed. But what that did do is on the heels of the, the horrific uh, mass uh, shooting and, and massacre in uh, the, the community of Buffalo, we were able to uh, make sure that uh, resources were included in the uh, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And what this act has done is it has created an opportunity for resources upwards of $250 million to be put aside to help us scale up gun violence prevention strategies and efforts across the country. It's also created an opportunity for us to um, access well over 10 to $15 billion for mental health support services that will allow us as uh, organizations and even faith communities to help build out robust responses for, from our institutions to address gun violence. So I say all that to say that I do believe in this moment, while we are uh, witnessing the spiking of gun violence in so many of our communities across the country, uh, we do have an opportunity as uh, the black church, as uh, uh, adjudicatories, as uh, denominations, as independent churches, as uh, professionals in the mental health field, 
uh, individuals who are reentering our society uh, and our communities because of uh, past activities in, that resulted in them being incarcerated, we do have the opportunity to now build public health uh, and culturally appropriate uh, mental health interventions, public health interventions that are related to gun violence in our communities. Um, our hope is to continue to partner with Black churches uh, all across the country, uh, with denominational bodies, with um, departments within denominational bodies, uh, all across the spectrum of uh, the difference and the, and the uh, identities that make up our communities to make sure that we do have interventions that uh, our tax dollars in this country can be leveraged to make sure that we are reducing the numbers of gun-related shootings and homicides all across the country. This is what we do know. We do know how to re reduce gun violence without uh, having to grow uh, the prison population. We do know how to reduce gun violence without having to uh, flood more money into police agencies. And one of my hopes and certainly one of my concerns is that too often across the country, the singular response to gun violence in our communities too often is uh, equated with the number of police officers we have in our communities. Uh, too often our pastors, our churches, our clergy, our organizations uh, feel hesitant if, uh, if not opposed to making sure that we are offering alternatives to addressing crime and violence in our communities that do not require a continued investment of our tax dollars into the police apparatus without building out a public health alternative. And so what I do hope is that we can continue to partner with uh, certainly all of those who are on this call and beyond this call uh, in cities across the country to make sure that we can train, we can uh, help implement and scale these efforts um, so we can indeed reduce the number of gun-related shootings and homicides in our country. Uh, as I close, I just want to highlight that uh, the issue of police brutality is still an issue of great concern. Uh, we ought not allow this issue to escape uh, our radar. Uh, this issue of uh, continued police brutality, continued uh, extrajudicial killings of both armed and unarmed uh, Black uh, black uh, uh, Americans uh, is something that we all should be uh, very, very concerned about. Uh, the disproportionate deaths of black men, of tra black trans folks and, and black women at the hands of the police in this country uh, has not abated even under this current administration. We continue to have a lack of accountability by law enforcement. Uh, we continue to lack uh, a basic uh, uh, safeguards and reforms by law enforcement. Uh, and it is very, very important for us, even in the midst of the rise of, of uh, gun-related shootings and homicides in this country, that we do not uh, lose sight that law enforcement officers and agencies uh, police our communities very differently. And we ought not uh, let go of that rope of ensuring that we have a reimagined public safety system in this country. That continues to be a big part of our work uh, it must happen often at the local level uh, because we do not believe we have federal support uh, for the kind of accountability that your local uh, city council members and mayors can do uh, across the country. So as we continue to be a, a support and a partner, we will uh, do all that we can to make sure that we can provide you some of the best training uh, at no cost to your jurisdiction, your church, uh, we hope to offer uh, as many resources as possible. You can visit our livefreeusa.org website and uh, uh, let us know how we can be a blessing and support uh, to the church. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with you tonight. Thank you, Pastor Mike. And Pastor Mike will be with us um, at our annual AIM conference coming up um, uh, in just next week. Uh, but he'll be able to answer some questions uh, that you may have um, before we get off of this call. I'm going to call uh, to the stage um, Elder uh, Ladarius Beal, uh, one of our coordinators, and he's going to take us further into um, tonight's program. Brother Beal. Well, thank you, Bishop Swan, and my God, we have already heard some pretty good uh, insights, and we are well on our way here. Uh, as we move forward with our program tonight, we are about to hear about the implications of the Supreme Court's decisions on civil rights. 
uh, as this court continues to be a somewhat activist or actually an, an activist court. And these judges are making some decisions that really impact uh, black people um, in particular. And so coming to expand on that is, is my friend and big brother, uh, the attorney Ulysses Henderson, who is an accomplished intellectual property attorney, and he is doing some great things, serving on various boards of directors and helping the community move forward. So let's hear from Bishop uh, Attorney Henderson at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Brother. Uh, thank you to Bishop Swan giving me this opportunity to be able to come and to uh, address all of you um, on tonight. Um, and so as we um, consider the implications of sort of the Supreme Court rulings, um, during this term, there's really been, there's been three um, significant decisions that have taken place during this term of the Supreme Court that have, um, I think, some significance on civil liberties. The first one is the case uh, Kennedy, Kennedy versus Brimmer, Bremerton School District. Um, and that is where the Supreme Court decided um, that the First Amendment uh, protects an individual's right to freely practice their faith. The question that was brought before the court uh, in that case was whether or not a high school football coach um, has the right to pray privately on the field uh, after a game. And uh, this, court, this coach uh, was asked by the school district to stop and cease religious activity. Um, and of course, this matter uh, made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that uh, this coach had the right uh, to be able to uh, practice his personal faith. Second, the second case um, during the term of the, the Supreme Court is Carson v. Macon. And uh, this is where Supreme Court um, ruled that um, a law in the, in the state of Maine prohibiting students from choosing to use their uh, educational aid funds to attend parochial schools um, did not violate the constitution. Um, and they said that it, re it reaffirmed that states cannot disfavor schools on the account of their faith. Uh, I want to note, Chief Justice uh, Roberts wrote, and I quote, in particular, we have repeatedly held that a state, a state violates the free exercise clause when it excludes religious observers from otherwise um, available public benefits. And so we see here in these two decisions of the Supreme Court coming in and making uh, uh, rulings based upon civil liberties, large, in fact, uh, due to faith. Um, and, uh, and then the third one, which by far is the most controversial, the one that has been kind of taking uh, the whole country by storm, uh, is the case of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, uh, the decision that uh, overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, and the facts surrounding this case was that in, in 2018, uh, Mississippi State's uh, legislature, they passed a 15-week abortion ban, uh, which means that a baby could not be aborted after 15 weeks. And uh, the Jackson Women's Health Organization filed a lawsuit in federal court challenging whether uh, Mississippi had the constitutional authority to enforce its pro-life law. Um, and the Supreme Court weighed in on this and with a five to four vote, um, they said that there was no right to abortion uh, in the Constitution, which is very, very interesting. Um, here, they, I think that they tried to find a, a, a fine line. Now, I want you to understand that in the previous cases of Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, um, the right to, uh, of a woman to have an abortion was large, in fact, centered around the rights of privacy. And um, we, we find that that really came to um, a, um, to uh, uh, sort of a, a heightened degree when you look back at um, um, this, the, the, the case called um, uh, Vir Loving v. Virginia, which regulated whether uh, interracial marriages could take place. And that was centered around the right to privacy. And so here uh, in this case, the Dobbs case, um, the Supreme Court, they said that there was no explicit right to an abortion found in the constitution. Of course, you're not gonna find that <laughs> in, written within the constitution, but I do think that that right squarely fits within the public or the privacy right of an individual. Justice Alito wrote, we hold that Roe 
uh, that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision. Now, now I've been trying to explain to so many people that this recent Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade is not really about abortion. Mm. Because if you really look at the study and the trends, what you will discover is that abortion rates have actually been on a steady decline since the Roe versus Wade decision, right? This is not this proliferation. And what happens is now when you begin to regulate abortions, it now makes abortion more dangerous. They're not gonna stop people from getting abortions, but now it makes the process more dangerous. But, but this decision it is actually, in my opinion, it is actually a sad commentary for people of color because it shows us, watch this, it shows us what is really important to America. It shows us that we can regulate what a woman chooses to do with her body, but we can't pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It, it shows us that, 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 that we've been, we, we can do all of these different things, but we cannot now pass um, and the Supreme Court will watch this. They will actually overturn stricter gun control laws, right? We, we, we can, we can uh, overturn Roe versus Wade, but we cannot pass the George Floyd Policing Rights Act. So basically, we care more about people who are not born than those who have already been born. Listen, I, I don't believe that abortion should be used as a mechanism of birth control, right? There is no debate that abortion from a biblical perspective is murder, but abortion is not that simple, right? There, there are, there, there are um, uh, uh, many other implications that come into why a person may want to choose to have an abortion. Now watch this, abortion is murder, but so is killing unarmed black men and black women, but we're not regulating that, right? I, I believe that this is a decision between a woman and God because the body, the Bible tells us that what? Our bodies are the temple of God. So the government can come in and play God when it wants to play God, but then turn a blind eye when it doesn't care. Th th these are important. A and some evangelicals are actually rejoicing over this decision, but they press the mute button, the mute button when it came to speaking out on the death of George Floyd, or when it came to speaking out on the death of Tamir Rice, or when it came to speaking out on the death of Alton Sterling, or Walter Scott, or Ahmaud Arbery, or Breonna Taylor, or the mass shooting in Buffalo, New York. Listen, we can regulate how a woman chooses to do with her body, but we cannot pass stricter control, gun control laws, which puts hands, guns in the hands of terrorists who can now turn around and say that they have mental health issues. Listen, we have to understand really what is the implication here, because if you really look down in history, what we find is that we find that government regulation has typically been used in history as a means to regulate personal privileges and rights. Because when we see after the Emancipation Proclamation, what the government did was they came out with these things called vacancy laws, which means that if you didn't have a job and they found you out on the street, you could be locked up. Well, you just came out of slavery. What job do you have? Right. So then it turned from vagrancy laws into Jim Crow laws, where it's interesting because you had uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, which had to do with whether you can sit on uh, in a particular place um, in a in a train. And it's interesting that the Supreme Court had the nerve to say you can have rights as long as it's separate and equal. How is it separate and equal when you have one uh, uh, um water fountain that's clean and another water fountain that's dirty, right? One bathroom that's clean, the other bathroom that's a mess. So we find that this has happened throughout the course of history that, that the regulators will step up to regulate certain activities that it really wants to have a hand on, but others it'll turn a blind eye. So I want you to understand here that for many lawmakers, this decision is about a loss rather than a principle. Ever since Roe versus Wade, they've been trying to find ways in order to come and chip out, chip away at this decision that's happened because for them, it was more of a loss, not so more of a principle. And, and, and so here people are saying, okay, um, um, you know, 
uh, uh, Planned Parenthood, you know, they were they were created um, with the premise of annihilating black folks. So here it is, evangelicals, if you care so much about protecting lives, then why are you not in the front line of protecting lives that are actually born? You're mute. We don't hear anything. And so here what we have to understand is that we have to understand the implications of what takes place. Um, and, and I forgot, um, um, I, I preached on this um, this past weekend, and unfortunately it's, it's a scripture in the book of Proverbs. And it basically says that the righteous understand justice, but the wicked don't. <clears throat> and the question for us that we have to understand is if, if we are the righteous, we should understand justice. <clears throat> we should have a clear understanding of the implications that take place when we have regulators who will regulate one thing, but will fail to step up and regulate other things. So we as black and brown people, we have to vote. We have to be engaged in the process. And I'm closing with this. The thing that they do is that they dangle um, in the faces uh, of religious organizations is that they say, we'll give you an exemption. However, you cannot speak out, right? As a 501c3 entity, you cannot speak out on political issues, right? And so on one hand, they dangle a carrot, but on the other hand, they take our voice. We cannot allow government to take our voice. Like Pastor McBride said, we have to be at the front line as, as Bishop Felton said, we have kingdom authority. We need to speak out, not just on small issues or not just on scripture, but we need to speak out on social justice. And I'll end right there. Thank you, Bishop Henderson for those, those remarks. And we're uh, moving on to Between Civil Rights and the Hashtag Generation. And Reverend Dr. Brianna K. Parker, who is a faith leader, scholar, and data activist is going to come. She is also the CEO of the Black Millennial Cafe LLC, which is a consulting practice and data resource center for black churches, communities, and organizations. So let's receive our guest here, Reverend Dr. Brianna Parker, and she takes us further. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Bishop Swan, for the invitation. Um, so I'm, when I talk to you, I'm going to talk to you from a couple of different projects that I've done. First uh, would be from um, the Black Millennial Profile, which is kind of how my company started as the uh, first researcher to have extensive quantitative and qualitative data on the Black uh, on Black millennials and faith. The other will be from the newest state of the Black church study in which I served as lead researcher. And then we also had um, the church's response to Black Lives Matter that we did in conjunction with Black Church PAC. So I first wanna say this, when we think about civil rights and you know hashtag movement and what justice means to young people, I wanna first uh, lead with this. When we did in the latest study of the state of Black church study, when we looked at generations appreciation of what the black church has done or where we are on social issues, boomers were least pleased with the church and where we are on social issues, while millennials were most pleased with the church and where we are on social issues. So I think we sometimes began making the assumption that millennials are the most upset in every area or the most displeased in every area. And that's just not true. We looked at social issues, boomers had uh, the major issue with the Black church and where we found ourselves. I think we also see a major divide because the Black church has made some assumptions and we use data uh, that white people have used and white people have collected uh, and white people were the uh, subjects for. And we take the research done by white people, collected by white people and survey uh, that were surveyed they were surveying white people, and then we try to adapt them in our own communities. And so when the Methodist Church released a study and statistics on whether or not congregations, most specifically millennials, could appreciate politics coming from the pulpit, uh, 
I remember how viral that statistic went and black pastors were saying things like, this is why I don't talk about this, or this is why I leave politics or justice out of the pulpit. And this is why I leave this kind of information to the news because it doesn't belong in churches. Well, that's what white millennials believe. But in our study with black millennials, we got to see that one of the top three things that black millennials wanted to see in black churches and in the pulpit was absolutely issues of justice because we did not want to have to divorce our reality uh, from, we did not want to have to divorce our reality from our church life. So we don't want to have to take off the truth of what we live in order to walk through the doors of the church. It means when we go to church, we have to not only hear about something that's to come that we can also have on earth, right? That there's peace and there's joy. And we don't want to hear about these things. And if they, if they're not going to um, show up in our lives and they can only show up in our lives if the church does the work of justice. And so black millennials were clear that we do want to hear justice. We do want to know what the Bible says regarding black lives being shot down. Speaking of black lives, I thought it was most appropriate for the black church pack and black millennial cafe to do work on civil rights and black, black lives matter. We wanted to know what they thought when we talk about black lives matter and the black church often, uh, we really get caught up in the wrong things. Who started the Black Lives Matter movement? What that means for people? Are they going to, I don't know, somehow become homosexual because there are homosexuals who started? Are they somehow going to take on the practices of some of the leaders? But when we actually survey, most people, the majority of the respondents said that Black Lives Matter had little to do with the founders or the organization when they heard it, but it was most like a call to action for them. And so when we stay away from this language, it actually doesn't draw millennials in. It turns them off because we actually believe that that's something that should be said and spoken of and considered in church. We also asked if people would leave their church, if Black Lives Matter was not um, a concern, was not um, a part of the movement of their church. And 45.9% of the respondents said they would actually leave their church if their church could not support Black, uh, Black Lives Matter. I think we've gotten to a place where we believe um, that there are enough organizations or there are enough groups for us to be able to kind of leave justice work to other organizations so that we can just have church. The truth is, if you have church and don't mention justice, you don't have church. You just simply have some type of, I don't know, country club that you're running. This is not what Black millennials want to hear, and it's not what they should walk away with. When we also surveyed in the State of the Black Church study, and we surveyed um, generations from elders to boomers to Generation X millennials, and I think the top, the oldest five years, the people in the oldest five years, of uh, the first five years of Generation Z, because that's who you can legally survey. We wanted to know uh, what they believe the Black church was responsible for. And issues of immigration and education and really serving the people and policy were low on the list. And it's only low on the list because the church has not made clear that we have responsibilities outside of just teaching the Bible. And we have decided to really divorce some of the issues that are stickier for us instead of actually preaching on them, wrestling with them and struggling with people. But black millennials want to know that you're willing to have the conversation, even if you don't know the final answer, or even if someone seems to get offended. We actually want to believe that this is something that you're willing to do with us and not just perfect it in the study and then come out and present something amazing before us. I think we have to get to the point where we realize that a lot of things are changing um, historically. And we can see that when we look at political identification, we can see that when we look at religious um, identification, but we really were able to see it when we came across the, the statistic or we created, gathered the uh, data that 75% of the black church believes black people are politically powerless. <laughs> it's the church that preaches on power, the church that stands on power cannot make our believers and our parishioners believe that power should be beyond the pulpit, the pew and Sunday morning. I don't know if they believe it exists at all. 
So shame on every preacher for not being able to get people to the point where they believed in power of uh, the power of Jesus Christ enough that not only can it cast out demons and heal the sick, but it can regulate a, a horrible, evil government that we seem to not even want to control. If we want to use the power that's within us to do everything else, we also have to believe that we have power that can fight for justice, that we have power that can stop fools on John on January 6th from going and storming the Capitol. Our power has to go beyond the pulpit and the pews. And so what I really want us to think of when we think about the divide between generations on um, politics and justice is that more than being more there's more of a divide in belief and faith than there is from generation to generation because if black people don't believe in power ain't nobody got hope for power <laughs> thank you so much Thank you, Reverend Parker, uh, for that presentation. I want to bring to the stage and stick with us. If you've got any questions, please use the Q&A function. These presenters are going to come back and they're going to give us some tangible action steps uh, that we need to take in the areas that they spoke about. But I'm going to bring uh, to the stage at this time uh, one of our coordinators, Elder Joseph Shannon, uh, and he will then present our last two presenters, and then we'll get into uh, next steps in our Q&A. Uh, Brother Shannon. Hello, hello. If everyone can hear me. We can. I, seen this. I, can't, I hadn't seen the screen change. That was uh, some very powerful and awesome words from our previous speakers. Uh, having uh, had the opportunity to meet all of them personally, I know what they are sharing here on your screen is something that they uh, share with anyone and everyone that will listen and they are doing the work that goes along with the talk. Uh, it's an amazing thing to see. Uh, we have some more to come and I think you're going to be more than satisfied to what we have next. Uh, we have uh, one of our only, probably our only elected official on our panel today. She represents the great state of North Carolina. She's a graduate of the North Carolina a and uh, State University, her doctoral degree from North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2017. Uh, she ran for city council. Um, she retired from her position from the president's at, president at Saints College uh, and her professional experience is probably are too expansive for us to even mention at this moment. But she's gonna share with us some insight that I believe that she has um, that I don't think anyone else can speak to in this specific moment today. She's going to share with us about what it is like uh, to be an elected official in today's climate. Uh, not only just an elected official, but a save and sanctified elected official in today's climate. Um, Dr. Goldie, or Dr. Wells, forgive me. Great to see you. Please share your insights uh, with us today. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to, to share tonight. I am uh, Dr. Goldie Wells, and I serve on the Greensboro City Council in Greensboro, North Carolina. I have served on the council for three terms, and I'm presently running for re-election for the next four years. I represent a district that is major majority minority with 50,000 citizens. The question that I'm going to address is how do elected uh, officials, government officials, navigate the political arena as a saint. Well, I believe, and I've listened to all of you tonight, and it's been a great discussion, but when it comes to city council, we have some authority to deal with some of the things that you've been addressing. I believe that every saint is a part of the community, and I think that the saint should be a light in the community. The saint should be a law abiding, a uh, in the citizen in the community. And I think that a saint should be an outstanding citizen in the community. I became involved in the political arena by being just that in my community. I served as a grassroots leader to stand for justice and equality. I think saints should only go or run for office, for political office, if they have a mind to work for justice for all people 
in their community. Uh, we had a, a grocery store in our community and, and they just decided they wanted to leave. They said, well, you just have to come to our new store. So uh, I got involved and started a, an organization uh, that tried to keep the grocery store. And uh, that uh, was a, a big battle. And then later on, we had a, a landfill in our near our community and they wanted to reopen it, it had been closed and I got involved with that. So uh, one thing after another, uh, fighting for, for justice for our community. So we did get the landfill closed, but there were other injustices that continued to rise. And the leadership that I had displayed was the reason that I was able to be elected. I have been able to stand for this community for a while now. But as a saint, there's a tightrope that you have to walk because a saint who is saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, then that means you have a different lifestyle than most politicians. It means that there's a lot of things that go on around you, in your community, among your colleagues, and in the political arena that are truly political. They're not based on any Bible principles, and that's what we live by. So you must become one who is able to stand for what's right, no matter what. You have to know what you believe, you have to know in whom you believe, and then you have to have enough courage to stand for those beliefs. Uh, we deal with all of the issues that have been addressed tonight. We really do. Uh, I found that standing on the principles of holiness has caused my colleagues to respect me for my beliefs. I, I get jokes sometimes about, well, when are you gonna wear your pants? See, I'm old school, I don't wear pants. So when are you gonna wear some pants? Uh, uh, then if they use profanity, they'll say, oh, excuse me, Goldie, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, but when it comes to prayer, if they need prayer, then they call on me. They also know that there's certain things that I'm not going to vote for. And I make it very plain and very clear that some things are against my convictions and my beliefs, and I'm not going to vote for that. I am what's, uh, for what's right for every citizen, uh, but my stance on different issues is based on my Christian belief. I do not think we have to compromise to serve our community. To serve in government, I believe that you must be firm in your beliefs and you have to use the power of the Holy Ghost to know when to speak and when to keep quiet and how to navigate in this different world. A Christian who serves in a political office should serve so that there is justice for all, not just to advance their own agenda or interests. There's a lot of recognition that comes with being an elected official and publicity and honor. You know, they call it the honorable. So a lot comes with being an elected official. But I'm serving for justice and equality for the people in District 2. Uh, they are underpaid, and they are underserved, and they are marginalized. The scripture tells us in Deuteronomy 16 and 20 to follow justice and justice alone. In Matthew 25 and 40 it says, in as much as you've done it for one of my least, the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. As an elected official, I'm seeking the common good for the common good that requires collaboration with all people of goodwill and those who don't mean good. I want to show by working with my fellow councilmen, uh, by working with the community leaders and by working with the individual citizens and constituents that I want to do what's right. And I want, and at what I would believe that the Lord would have me to do. Before I decided to run for office, 
people were asking me to run, but I was very hesitant about it. That was because of my beliefs. I, I didn't know whether a saved person should try to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. During the prayer clinic, and some of you remember Bishop Clements had a prayer clinic here in Greensboro, I talked to Senator Yvonne Miller, who was an about saint, who was the first black uh, elected senator in the state of Virginia. And she said, everybody can't do it. But if you can, go ahead. So I took that as a clue. And I've learned that it does take one who can deal with folks who do not believe what you believe to be able to still collaborate and negotiate to make things better for those that you serve. I believe the Lord needs saints in the places of influence to make life better for all of his creations. Uh, the thing, I know we're gonna have a discussion a little bit later, but all of these things we deal with, when I sit up there in the chambers, we deal with the police, we deal with the fire, we deal with them, we see all of that. But then we have to make decisions. And that's where I have to call upon the Lord to help me to stand for what's right. And I really am charged tonight when I hear you saying, that we have a responsibility. And because we belong to him and because we have power that he has given us, we should use it. And, and I remember all of the civil rights movements when they, that my daddy was uh, worked for Dr. King. He was his first field secretary and they had all of their meetings. They would have their meetings at the church. That's the place that they sang the songs and prayed before they went out to march. And we have just gotten so silent. It's just as uh, uh, Attorney Henderson said, we, we've gotten the 501c3s have, have calmed us down, but we need to speak out. Thank you for this opportunity. Brother Shannon, back in your hands. You're muted, brother. I, I think you're still muted. I'm right, we good now? There you go. All right, uh, great insight from Dr. Wells, uh, we appreciate all the work that you do in North Carolina, and I know the people, the citizens of Greensboro appreciate you as well. And the perspective that you have in respect to how to approach justice from the perspective of the saints. Uh, next, we have um, Bishop David D. Daniels, Daniels, or the third, who is uh, is the loose loose professor of the world Christ at World Christianity at McCormick Theological Seminary. Please forgive me. He is the Henry Renters Loose Professor of World Christianity at McCormick Theological Seminary, where he joined the faculty in 1987. I think that's very important to emphasize. The other thing is he is also the head of the Office of Research for the General Assembly for the Church of God in Christ. Now, I didn't read all of his bio because I want him to have ample enough time to answer a very important question. The question he's going to answer us for today is, when our theology or our culture has a confrontation with Christianity or the gospel. Dr. Daniels, love to hear your insights, sir. If you're ready thank to you. go, <laughs> I would love to hear what you have to say about that, sir. Thank you, Elder Shannon. And um, thank you, uh, Bishop Swan and the committee for inviting me. Thank you for all the panelists. Uh, this has been inspiring. And I appreciate not only your insight, but your commitment to Christ and to justice. I preached a sermon once called Jesus and Justice. And I think we're hearing that tonight. So I'm talking about when Kojic doctrine and culture clash, speaking the truth in love. So first of all, um, we should know that we're called, we don't follow the world, we follow Christ. Um, we're not trying to follow Jesus. We're not trying to, we, we are following Jesus. We're not conforming to the world. 
we're conforming to Christ. I've been always struck by two scriptures. One is 1 Peter 2 and 11, and the other one is 2 Chronicles 29 and 15. And in both of them, they have a phrase that is very similar. 1 Peter 2 and 11, according to King James Version, says it this way. We're called to be strangers and uh, pilgrims. Um, another version says aliens and sojourners. We also find that in 1 Chronicles 29 and 15. Strangers before God and sojourners. Um, sometimes the, the, it's also called aliens again and pilgrims. Um, one author puts it this way. We are strangers and that we do not feel at home here in this world. We are pilgrims for we're on our way to a new city called the New Jerusalem. And we are aliens for our citizenship is in another country um, called heaven. Um, so our views are not the world's views. Our values are not the world's values and our ways are not the world's way. We do not need to be apologetic about it. As Dr. Wells says, it's just fact. We are called to follow Christ and not the world. But as we then engage others, um, giving both our views and sharing our values, we do it in love. We don't do it in a condemning, um, uh, uh, derogatory kind of way. Um, we are, as I said, we're able then to be strangers and pilgrims. And as a denomination, I remind people that the Church of God in Christ is not trying to follow the fundamentalists, nor are we trying to follow the mainline churches. We are trying to follow the Bible. We're trying to do what the gospel says. So if you look at the history of this church, we are a church that believes in peace and we're against war in all its forms. We're a church that believes in the sanctity of life. And that's why we are against capital punishment. It is, the Church of God in Christ believes the execution of prisoners is immoral and unbiblical and should be made illegal. Church of God in Christ also believes in sobriety. So we're against the consumption of alcoholic beverages in any forms. And we're also uh, for good stewardship, meaning we're against gambling and other forms way of wasting money. We are called, again, as 1 Peter 2 and uh, 11 says, to be strangers and pilgrims. As Dr. Wells says, there's some things we can be in a coalition with around issues, but there's other things we have to buy out or vote no. I wanna share now some resolutions that have been passed by the General Assembly of the Church of God in Christ, especially during the 2010s. And these resolutions will show that on one hand, we might sound like we're leaning in one direction, but we'll challenge it by moving in another direction. So if you look at our resolution on climate change, yes, the Church of God in Christ in 2013, the General Assembly, which is our legislative body, approved a resolution on climate change. What we said was, quote, that the prospect of the widening or wide reaching impact of climate change and its potential to burden our communities particular of uh, the poorest among them with suffering, we are compelled to take action. And then it went on to say that we quote, recognize the facts that our climate change from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You need to realize there are people on the radio, there's televangelists that don't believe in climate change, that say it's false, that say it's a big lie. The Church of God in Christ says, no, they're wrong. We say climate change does exist, we say we need to address climate change, not only in our congregations, but we need to call upon our governments to address climate change. Because we see that this planet is dying from pollution and other things that are going on. So we might look like we're everybody else who might be on the right, but we challenge those that are climate change deniers and call them liars. Um, we then need to engage then our members, educate our members, because they're listening to radio, they're listening to televangelists, they're reading all this stuff. We don't need to try to tell them um, what they need to believe. We just need to let them know this is what the Church of God in Christ believes. Then, um, especially during this pandemic, um, dealing with COVID-19, um, there were communiques that came from the presiding bishop and from the general board. Um, in all those communiques, it said that the scientific facts stated by the center, the US, United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we are listening to them. We are seeking to engage the science critically. Um, we as a denomination um, follow the, the guidelines. Um, I know congregations that were Church of God in Christ that distributed masks 
that had testing on their site, that were vaccine sites. Um, and I even know in Kenya, some of our churches were doing that. We were following the CDC guidelines. Now again, televangelists, some radio preachers, they will tell you um, that um, this is false, that we should not do vaccines, that we should not wear masks, that we should believe in God. The Church of God in Christ says we believe in God and wear masks, believe in God and take the vaccine, believe in God and follow science in a critical way. So we need to tell our members that when they hear things that are not Church of God in Christ, they need to understand where we are as a denomination so that they can be able to at least listen to what our denomination is saying. Then in 2014, um, there was a resolution on same-sex marriage. Um, the Church of God in Christ stated that marriage is, quote, a covenant between a man and a woman. But it went on and said, and this is key for me, that, quote, the Church of God in Christ, quote, condemns acts of violence against and the subjugation of any person to verbal or physical harassment on the basis of their sexual practice. Such action violates the Christian's obligation to love our neighbor as ourselves. What that means is that in the Church of God in Christ, we do not believe in ridiculing, mocking, harassing people because of their sexual orientation. The Church of God in Christ is against that. We condemn that. That's what the General Assembly approved in a resolution in 2014. We condemn it. We are against it. We are not for violence. So again, if you hear a radio preacher, you hear a televangelist, you hear somebody who's going out condemning gays and lesbians, uh, calling for violence against them, either verbally or physically, that is against Church of God in Christ teaching. And then lastly, I want to mention in 2019, there was a resolution on the sanctity of life. Um, in that resolution, in, in preparation for that resolution, I should say, there was a heated debate trying to find a way to get the resolution from going in a direction that really would overstate a Kojic position to one that would capture, as I've been trying to describe, the Church of God in Christ not seeking to follow anybody. We're seeking to follow the Bible. And if we're going to follow somebody, we're seeking to follow Jesus. So in that resolution, the Church of God in Christ says they oppose, quote, elective abortion, unquote. So the Church of God in Christ then leaves room for, now this is my reading, emergency abortions and abortions related to the welfare of the mother. Um, there's a statement that says that the Church of God in Christ was very concerned about the health and well-being of women, unquote. Um, and then there was a call for, quote, um, I almost says, as uh, a pastor attorney, Bishop Henderson said, um, we need to have a holistic understanding to the sanctity of life. So the Church of God in Christ called for, quote, child care, financial support, education, and other creative ways to support parents, unquote, in raising their children. Church of God in Christ is not a one issue denomination. Church of God in Christ is not even dealing with abortion as a one issue topic, but looking for the holistic way. So again, pastors need to engage um, the members in their congregation and, and help them understand that you might listen to somebody who, or you might even be in a state that says calling for a total ban on abortion, no questions asked. That is not the Church of God in Christ perspective. As I read the statement and overheard the conversation leading to it, because again, we are concerned about the welfare and well being of women, but we are against elective abortions. Lastly, related to that though, is that as, as uh, Bishop Henderson said, we need to then call for all of our conservative brothers and sisters and say, join us in calling for universal child care for people who cannot afford it. Join us in calling for a guaranteed income so that people don't have to raise children in poverty. Find other creative ways. That's the kind of things I believe we need to call people to do as a Church of God in Christ perspective. We then, as pilgrims and aliens, will make a lot of people mad, but I hope we'll make God happy and will be a positive difference in this world in holding up the banner of Jesus Christ and working for justice and showing that we are people who don't try to follow the world,
We don't try to follow the Republican or Democratic Party. We don't try to follow fundamentalists or mainline denominations. We're trying to follow Jesus. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists who have presented thus far. Um, what I want to do now is I want to go around to our panelists before we do our Q&A, and, and, and I, I wanted to keep this to a 90-minute window. Um, I, I want them to give us some next steps, some action steps in terms of the areas um, that they were speaking to us about. Um, what are the action steps in terms of uh, what the church can do, what people can do in their local communities, in their regions, um, in order to facilitate change um, and to move the needle? So I'm going to start with Bishop J. Lewis Felton, uh, who talked about um, the church um, to move towards justice. Uh, tell us, Bishop, what can we do in our local church to push the envelope in advocating for justice? Thank you, Bishop Swan. Certainly one of the things that we can do and should do is preach about justice. Uh, the word of God teaches us that justice begins at the house of God. And so if justice begins with us as a kingdom entity, then we must preach a message of justice which requires a certain anointing. Uh, Jesus, in reading from Isaiah 61, said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. A message of enfranchisement, empowerment uh, to the poor is obviously a message of justice. When we preach about setting at liberty them that are bruised, opening the prison to them that are captives, opening the eyes of the blind, proclaiming that this is the year of the Lord's favor. That is a message of justice. We must also be prepared for what happens when you preach that kind of message. For after Jesus read that scripture and said that it was fulfilled in the eyes of those who were in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, the reaction was that they pushed Jesus to the brow of the hill that they might throw him down headlong to kill and destroy him. When you preach a message of social justice, you must be prepared uh, for the reaction that you will receive. Of course, one of the reaction is you will receive a backlash from people who are actually ignorant let us understand that ignorance is not the lack of knowledge. It would be wonderful if ignorance were only the lack of knowledge. Ignorance is resistance to knowledge, the hatred of knowledge. It is fighting against enlightenment and truth. And it is a contagious disease. And when you preach this kind of message, you will stir up a reaction from within and from without those who reacted adversely to the Lord Jesus Christ preaching social justice in his hometown synagogue. These were people from the community of faith. And some of your worst opposition will come from those who are apathetic, indifferent, resistant to change from within the community of faith. Uh, I preached this at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta when we had our leadership conference there, that Martin Luther King was so hated by the president of his own convention that when the city of Chicago changed the name of the street that that president's church was on to Martin Luther King Drive, he then changed the address of his church so that he would not have to put King's name on his stationary letterhead and church bulletins. Mm. This is a very serious matter. We wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, some of which are in religious organizations. And of course, we should partner with organizations that are doing justice. Uh, Bishop Swan is the president of the NAACP in Springfield, Massachusetts. I was there and spoke for their Freedom Fund banquet as well as their Martin Luther King celebration. I'm first vice president here in Philadelphia, as well as first vice president of black clergy. 
You've got to get involved. It's a kingdom issue, not a church or denominational issue. Thank you, Bishop Swan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor uh, Mike McBride, um, you're on the ground uh, interrupting violence, um, advocating, grabbing resources. Uh, what steps can our, our local churches take in order to move the envelope? So uh, I am. I, I do believe as a pastor, uh, we have to uh, make sure we are teaching, preaching, and discipling our people away from violence. Uh, unfortunately, in this country, we have all been we have become desensitized to violence, whether it is state violence, whether it is interpersonal violence, and whether it is violence. Uh, in an effort to secure some form of peace. So one thing that we advocate for is for your congregation, uh, you as a minister, a missionary, evangelist, uh, to develop a peacemaking um, a sermon series, a, a sermon series that highlights the many scriptures, like blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, these are the words of Jesus. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah says, seek the peace of the city in which I have called you into exile. Uh, for if it finds its peace, you will find your peace. Uh, the passage already been mentioned uh, uh, in uh, uh, one of the apostles, uh, I believe it was Peter, follow peace with all and, and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. That both peacemaking and holiness go hand in hand together. So developing uh, a rigorous uh, message, a theology of peacemaking that helps our congregations, our laity, to embrace peace as a lifestyle. Uh, we certainly want to offer our services, uh, our training apparatus, our advocacy apparatus as a companion, a partner, a collaborator with uh, certainly the Church of God in Christ as a denomination, but also in your local city, you should find congregations to partner with to address the issue of gun violence and police violence in your city. Do not do it alone. Um, it is important for us to join together uh, to advocate for policies that include community violence intervention strategies. Now that we have billions of dollars made available for mental health support, um, hundreds of millions of dollars made available for community violence intervention strategies. Uh, what would it look like if every single one of our congregations actually created a justice and peace uh, team that actually helped to ensure we could spring and scale this work up all across the country. Last thing I'll say is we are launching a summer and fall Hope and Healing concert series where we'll be coming to uh, cities all across the country uh, with artists, with trainers, with public health practitioners, and with local uh, violence interrupters. Uh, if any cogent congregation would like to participate in that, uh, certainly uh, we will be sending that information uh, through the social justice ministry, through the women's department. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Mother Barbara McCool Lewis and the women's department, uh, the youth department as well. Uh, all of these parts of the Church of God in Christ will be in partnership with us to create hope healing uh, sessions uh, throughout the summer. Uh, obviously, we want to be in deep relationship uh, on this issue of gun violence and any police violence. And it's our honor to offer as much as we can, both in resources and infrastructure. So God bless. And of course, our prayers go out to the family of, of young brother Jalen uh, Walker, um, who was shot by police over 60 times in uh, Akron, Ohio, uh, just on this past Monday. And so we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you, Pastor uh, McBride. Let me bring on Bishop Henderson. Um, Bishop Henderson, um, what are the next steps we can take in terms of uh, how we deal with not just the Supreme Court uh, issue, but uh, there are issues with um, uh, judiciaries and, um, and with criminal justice uh, departments all over the nation. How can churches get involved uh, to mitigate some of the disparities we see in our criminal justice system? Sure, a couple of points I wanted to first say is that number one, I did not say that I support abortion or the Church of God in Christ support abortion. What I did say specifically is that I do not believe in the government regulating my personal decisions. They're, they're two separate things. 
Um, and so I believe that if the government is going to get involved in certain issues, they have to get involved in every issue. Um, but I want to make sure that that was specifically clear. The other is the scripture that, that, um, um, that I quoted was, was Proverbs 28 and 5. Proverbs 28 and 5, which says, evil people don't understand justice, but those who follow the Lord understand all things. In another interpretation, it says, understand it completely. Um, one of the things that we have to understand is that courts do not make laws. Um, legislators do, which means action item for us, we got to vote. <laughs> we have to understand and know what issues are prevalent within our communities. And oftentimes we're not engaged to, to that level. So we have to seek clarity. We have to understand those issues. Um, if we want change, we have to be involved in engaging um, uh, people who are running for government. Um, you know, many of the individuals seeking to be elected will come and try to come by the, the big churches um, and they will come in for five minutes and leave. I believe that if they really have an interest, they should sit through the whole service and we should hold people accountable um, for things. Don't just come to me for a soundbite or, or for an implied uh, endorsement. But if you really care about the community, you have to be engaged. So we have to step up to do that. We need to uh, teach our young people that th they should get involved. I mean, we, we need saved and sanctified uh, politicians and those, and I know that sometimes people find that um, there's some sort of conflict, um, but as Bishop Felton said, um, um, when God created us, his first commandment was for us to subdue the earth, right, which means for us to have power and influence, and if power and influence should be in the hands of anybody, it should be in the hands of the righteous, so I think, you know, the, the action item for us is to understand Seek understanding, understand government, um, understand laws and regulations within your communities. Vote, encourage your people to vote. You don't have to, you don't have to um, push a political party, but I think it's very, very important for you to encourage your members to vote. And the last thing that I say, speak on important issues that have to do with social justice, that have to do with inequality, we have to be a mouthpiece to speak. And if when we're silent, that says a lot. Sometimes what you don't say says way more than what you do say. And so I'll leave it with those action, with those action items. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Reverend Parker, uh, you talked about um, the, the bridging the gap between generations. Um, how can our millennials, our younger generation, um, get involved? Um, take their rightful role as leaders um, in our churches, in our community and push the envelope? Uh, one way is by giving voice and value. If we can't have voice and value in the place that we grew up or the place that we are in community, uh, then it's difficult for us to believe that we have voice and value um, in the world. It's also important to remember, um, you don't have to have a professional a researcher to be able to survey, figure out where you, where your members are, where your community stands on issues. And so it is okay to engage young people, even in surveying and in assessment so that you can know what they believe. Nobody gets to take anecdotal evidence to the bank for when you have a business plan. No one gets to take anecdotal evidence to a grant situation so that you can get more resources. So we should stop taking anecdotal evidence to um, our meetings to decide what young people need and how to get them involved. It is okay to talk and to engage. I cannot get collect data if I don't engage people. That's biblical. Instead of coming and assuming we know what people uh, want, remember John 5. This is a man who is standing between mercy and sacrifice. There are animals being slaughtered behind him, but the possibility of change before him. And although I'm sure Jesus knew what was wrong with him, Jesus still asked the question, do you want to be made well? And I think we need to ask more questions, ask people where they are, ask young people where they are, ask younger people what they want. And then don't forget, millennials, I'm a geriatric millennial, right? I'm on the uh, older and millennials are full-fledged adults vice presidents and companies it is okay to treat 
millennials like adults. Gen Z, yes, they are younger, but allow there to be respect that is mutual um, in relationships and allow mentoring to go both ways, that there's something I can learn from you other than just social media. And there's something you can learn from me. They were actually engaging and building relationships so that we understand each other better. We can get on the same page and we can use our gifts in ways we haven't before. I don't really agree with the the slogan that says this is not your grandmother's movement. I hope it's my grandmother's movement and I get to stand on her shoulders and make it better, but we have access to more in this movement. And so the best way for us to utilize everyone and take advantage of everyone who's at the table is to take an inventory of gifts. What do you bring? What do you want to bring? How do you want to walk this out? And then let's make sure everybody, everyone has a place. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, Dr. Wells, uh, I know Attorney uh, Henderson and Bishop Henderson hit on um, that we need to vote. Um, uh, what, what do our churches need to do? Because a lot of times people think um, if, if we get involved in the political process, it's going to affect our 501c3, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, talk to us about how we stay engaged. Well, well, that was the first point I had, that the church should be involved and well-informed in the political um, process in their local government. And then you're not going to get in trouble. It says you can't endorse. You can tell folk to go to the polls and, and get out the vote and all that, which is important. As long as you don't endorse, then you are fine. I um, was telling, I, I said something one Sunday in church and uh, I said, don't forget to vote. And the lady called me, uh, are you going to get our church in trouble? Because we're not supposed, I said, I didn't tell anybody who to vote for. So we need to get out the vote. It's very important. But you need to know who you're voting for. You need to find out what they stand for. And if they're not for the social justice and the issues that affect our community, then we don't need to vote for them. And there's some folks in office that we need to get out of office. So you don't know that until you are well informed get to know the officials, the elected officials that serve you uh, locally. They say all politics is local. They're the ones that take care of your street, your fire, your police. Now you need to know those officials. I don't believe in running around for two minutes at uh, election time and making a little speech and tipping out, but you, the, the elected officials should know what the folk in the community need. So the, can get things done much faster, police. Um, uh, if if you know your elected officials, I got a call from a, a, a pastor. He needed the street clothes for an event, but they were giving him trouble downtown. Well, all I had to do was call. So you need to know those officials so that they can help you. And I think we should be a beacon of of hope in our community. And of course, if we preach and teach the gospel uh, of truth then our land will be healed. We cannot forget what our focus is, that we have to preach the gospel and, and then the Lord will help us to be that uh, authority that we should be. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Dr. Daniels, um, yes. culture, uh, doctrine, clashing, um, what do we do? What are, what are the next steps for the church? So, so the first thing is that we need to know your church. Uh, I was talking to one of the young leaders in the church, and he didn't even know the code had a uh, statement, a resolution on climate change. All people who've been appointed to a position by the presiding bishop or the general supervisor needs to know their church. They need to know all of the social teachings of the Church of God in Christ, in addition to the doctrine of the Church of God in Christ. One of the things I want to put a plug in for real quickly is that there's a new book called The Church of God in Christ Standardized Ordination and Licensure Textbook. It has history, doctrine, uh, preaching, a whole bunch of things in it. Every pastor, every missionary, every elder, every minister, every credential holder, every national official needs to buy a copy of the book. You need to know your church. You might only know the church that you're from, where you grew up. But you might be an uh, abnormality in the church of God in Christ. You need to know whether you're in the mainstream or whether you're not. Second, um, read the legislations that you're called to vote on with Kojic social teachings in mind. Now, you only can do that if you know them. 
I'm not saying it should dictate what you vote, but you should at least read it in mind. And then lastly, um, we need to realize that there is no politician, there is no group that we're gonna agree with 100% unless we create. So I call us to engage in coalition politics. And in coalition politics, you rally around an issue. I agree with group A around this issue and group B around that issue. As I try to say in my, in my presentation, we're called to be aliens and pilgrims. This is not our home. So while we're traveling through here, we need to find out who can be our partners around particular issues. Church of God in Christ can't be pigeonholed. We're not fundamentalists and we're not like the main line. Why? We're trying to follow the Bible. Not to say they're not, but we're trying in the best that we know how. Thank you, Bishop Daniel. Uh, so I want to give a brief uh, few moments for Q&A, and I'm going to call um, Brother Shannon back. Uh, there are some, and we won't be able to get to all of them, um, but certainly we will follow up with those. Once again, um, those of you who want to be, who want to connect, become involved, please put your information in the chat, especially those of you who are on social media who are not in the webinar. We've, we've got about three or 400 who are at least on Facebook, not counting the other social media uh, who want, if you want to connect, uh, Brother Beal is going to come back after the Q&A and give you the information on how you connect with the social justice ministry. Come on, Brother Shannon, um, and spotlight a few of the questions that are on there. All right. Can everyone hear me fine? Good. I hope you can. Bishop, can you hear me? I'm waiting I for you. I hear you. Yes, All right, sir. Good. All right. Well, we have a few questions um, that are in the chat here in our Q&A section. We won't have time for all of them, but what we will do is uh, answer a couple of them real quick. I think Bishop already mentioned that if you would like to, um, oh, okay. If you would like to participate um, and if you would like to be a part of uh, what we have going here in the social justice ministry in the Church of God in Christ. If you put your email in the chat, you are more than welcome to do that. Then we can grab that and get in contact with you, right? So a couple of the questions in the in the question Q and A section were about that. So I hope I addressed them all. But there was one interesting question that came up uh, from Dr. Salim Jr. Um, and I'm going to ask this question, and prayerfully some of our panelists can jump on and answer this. It says this, it says, can a pastor legally have an, a personal political opinion separate from the church they pastor? In essence, if a pastor uses their personal social media platform to endorse a political candidate, will that conflict with the church's 501c3 mandate to not endorse political candidates? candidates? Interesting question. Uh, any of our panelists can jump on and answer that. I have a, a great answer for that because like uh, many of you, I'm a member of the Black Church Pack. So I kind of know the rules of what's going on. So if anyone wants to jump in and, and answer any that question. Any panelists want to jump on that? That would be great. Well, I, I, I think it's a slippery slope um, from the standpoint that everyone can be able to vote from their personal perspective. Um, but if you are making yourself out to, to speak on behalf of the church, um, then that could potentially create some issues. So everyone can, can be able to vote individually in terms of that. I, I would say that um, it's, from my opinion, it, it's, it's a little bit risky for, for leaders and pastors to openly come out and endorse because people don't know the line between a personal endorsement and an endorsement that seems to be um, um, one for your organization. Um, and so I think that, that, that just out of wisdom, I, 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 you, you can vote any type of way, but I think it does create um, some level of, of confusion between someone's personal um, in someone's personal endorsement and vote and that of, of their organization. Now there are some, you know, there, there are um, things that don't prohibit you just because your pastor does not mean that you can't vote a certain way or whatever. I just think that it's what kind of seems to appear um, that it's an endorsement coming from the organization and people who don't know a lot of the nuances will think that you're speaking on behalf of an organization, even when you're just speaking on behalf of yourself. 
Um, I'll just quickly uh, also say this is uh, Michael McBride that uh, two things you, your church or you can speak and your church can advocate um, for uh, nonpartisan measures. Um, you are you are not um, the 501c3 designation or boundary allows you and your church to do education, voter education. You can register folks to vote. Uh, you can give people uh, information about where they can vote, polling places, et cetera. Which um, is engage in partisan uh, politics, which just means that, you, as uh, Bishop Henderson just stated, you cannot uh, endorse formally uh, as a church or a 501c3. We have created the Black Church Pact uh, to be a safe space for. Uh, members of the Black Church who believe in a social justice agenda to be able to uh, gather and, and do partisan work if you so desire. And so we did find that there was a need for that, and that is part of why we have helped to uh, create the Black Church PAC and the Black Church Action Fund, which is a C4, which gives you a little bit more ability to do uh, things like, um, you know, particular races that uh, still fall short of a full endorsement, but particular races like judges or prosecutors or uh, 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 focus on specific kinds of races. Um, and so we're glad to continue to be a resource to help uh, educate with that as well. All right, Brother Shannon. Next Thank question. you so much. We got time for one more? Yes, go ahead. All right, great. Uh, there's, there's one here that comes from an anonymous person. So I'm not gonna read it. Here's one that I think, and I said that on purpose. So maybe anonymous can come on anonymous and ask their question. Uh, here's a question from Dr. Ross. Um, she, has, she asked the question, uh, if there is a place where she can grab the copy of the resolution that Dr. Daniels referred to about uh, environmental change. If there is a place that she can get that, she would love to speak on it. And I believe uh, Dr. Ross is running for Senate I don't know what state it is, but it look, looks like she's a candidate. So look like that, some information. Yeah, that uh, that document is available. If, if you are a delegate uh, to the General Assembly, um, you can go into the Kojic Arc system. And I believe it is the April 2013 General Assembly minutes um, where that resolution was passed. And, and that's archived there. And you can pull it right from there. Uh, awesome. Bishop Swan, is it possible for somebody to just upload it on the chat and then she can just download it before we get off? Um, I'll tell you what we can do. We can certainly pull it and then uh, if, if, if anyone is interested in receiving that, um, put your name in the chat and then we can certainly send an email out to those. Individuals. Great, great. Make, make you. Appreciate that, sir. Yes, sir. We got time for one more. Here's a question from Brother Tony Brewer. I'm going to shorten the question a little bit, Brother Brewer, uh, but I think the question is pointing directly to uh, this. He was asking specifically about constitutional lawyers, right? He was saying that there were some white constitutional lawyers, but he hasn't seen any black constitu constitutional lawyers. Uh, he was wondering if we know any um, and where they are. I guess that's his major question is where are the black constitutional lawyers and if they are uh, where, where can they be found? And then he was highlighting some remarks from some white constitutional lawyers that made some comments that, you know, could definitely go towards social justice and criminal justice reform. So if anyone on the panel knows any constitutional lawyers or have heard of anyone, can you jump on and give us some insight? You should be able to go to the NAACP Legal Defense, uh, um, and, and they, they are constituted by constitutional lawyers because they, they are seeking both to do legislation and also uh, move towards social justice. That, that, that would be my first start. And I'm, I'm also part of an organization called the National Bar Association. Um, and under the National Bar Association, there are a team of lawyers who are engaged in issues like voter rights, uh, who actually uh, litigate on behalf of protecting the rights of people in, um, in certain segments. So, um, uh, if you have a specific interest, you could um, email me. I, I put my name in the chat. And if there are any specific issues or needs, I can 
try to reach out to some of my resources and, um, and connect you with individuals uh, if there's any specific needs. All right. Thank you, Attorney Henderson. Bishop, was that our last question? Yeah, uh, so what, we'll, what we will do, um, Brother Beal is going to give you some information in terms of following up. If you wanna connect with the social justice ministry, um, whether you're in the webinar or whether you are online, I see some of those who are, who are on Facebook and other places who are asking how to connect. Uh, he is our executive secretary. He'll tell you how to make that connection. Um, and after he has completed, I'm going to ask Bishop J. Lewis Felton if he would give us a benedictory prayer. I want to thank you guys once again uh, for being here on tonight. To all of our panelists, you did a, a magnificent job of providing uh, information and, and action steps uh, of where we can go uh, from this point. Brother Bill. Well, first of all, Bishop, high regards to you for organizing and putting this on and to all the panelists and to our co-laborers here. Man, this has been incredible. And we've gotten a number of emails uh, dropped and contact information dropped in the chat. And we're gonna be seeing uh, how we can download those and uh, so that we can uh, begin to push out information to you. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram at Kojic Social Justice. Uh, all one word, lowercase, at Kojic Social Justice. You can find us there and we'll be highlighting our information, our news, events, and some other things uh, relative to what we're doing over here in the Kojic Social Justice uh, Ministry. Uh, look forward to the Facebook page that will be popping up in the next week. Um, and if you need to get in touch with us immediately, you can drop us a DM there at Kojic Social Justice, or feel free to reach out to me directly by email uh, ljbeal at kojic.org. That's L-J-B-E-A-L, B as in boy, E-A-L, at kojic.org. All right, you got that? Kojic Social Justice for on Instagram, or you can reach me directly, ljbeal at kojic.org. All right. Thank, thank you. Brother. Thank you, Brother Beal. I want to uh, once again uh, thank Bishop Felton, Pastor McBride, uh, Bishop Henderson, Reverend Parker, uh, Dr. Wells, Bishop Daniels, and each of you that have gathered on this evening. Uh, Bishop Felton, would you give us a benedictory prayer? Oh, Bishop, they are pouring into this Instagram already. I mean, they <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Swan. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we're thankful that you have blessed us to come together for this meeting of minds, this blending of ideas, and this sharpening our focus and our vision. You have brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we thank you, God, that you have placed within us the sensitivity of agape love, compassion for your people, as a part of our Judeo-Christian heritage, you established the nation of Israel as a theocratic entity. You are the head of the government and you are still the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And because you are the head, we honor you this evening and we follow your direction. We thank you for giving us as a church, a kingdom mentality. And we pray that you will give us grace to use the keys to the kingdom. We have church keys, but kingdom keys are much bigger. And we pray that the authority that you've given us, which is worldwide and interplanetary, will be maximized by us, that we may indeed not only wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, but that in being victorious, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We thank you for our convener, Bishop Tabert Swan and his committee. May you continue to give him grace for this ministry, that our church may continue to be a channel through which the blessings of justice flow. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you all so much for being here.